Good morning, everybody. Um, hopefully, all of your teachers have done a little bit of prep work for you for our guest speaker today. Uh, I'm going to do a little bit more of it, and some of it may be redundant, but we really want to make sure we set a proper context uh, for the very special opportunity we all have today and our very special guest. So Elizabeth Eckford um, of the Little Rock Nine the, um, is going to share her experiences from Central High School and how they shaped her life, as well as the country's future. Uh, she's going to share some very valuable lessons for all of us, but really, um, this presentation uh, is really going to be about you and the lessons that she is going to speak about, the themes that she is going to be speaking about are really about you. Uh, she was a 15 year old high school student um, during this very important period in American history. Um, some of the themes are going to include about taking our education for granted, uh, bullying, being a silent witness, that is somebody who sees something that is not right and does not do anything about it. Uh, the power of language, both the use of negative language as well as the power of positive language. Uh, and could you be somebody's help someday? Uh, can you help somebody get through another day at school? Uh, I know most of your teachers talk to you about these questions. What is school life supposed to be like? Why do you go to school? In all the classes I spoke with, the answers that I've heard were school life is supposed to be fun. It's supposed to be a place where you can make new friends, where you can take some chances, where you can have new opportunities, where you can educate yourself, where you can figure out what your path to a higher education might be, what the path to your career may be. Um, people go to school because they want to improve themselves, uh, want to advance, want to do something good. And the members of the Little Rock Nine went to school for the very same reason, the exact same reason why you all go to school. They were looking to have fun, they were looking to make friends, they were looking to get a better education, they were looking to put themselves on a better path for their future. Uh, Elizabeth Eckford and the Little Rock Nine, they were just like you. Just like you. They were 15, 16, 17 year old high school students. They were not civil rights activists, they were teenagers, dealing with everyday teenage issues. Um, they had the maturity to recognize that Central High School was going to provide them an opportunity for a better education, and they had the courage to step up to that challenge and try to reach their educational goals. So remember your first day of school, about how anxious you may have been, about the nervousness that you may have felt. Um, Elizabeth and the nine felt the same. I know that a lot of you have heard the story that Elizabeth walked to school by herself that first day that the governor of Arkansas had sent out the Arkansas National Guard to keep those kids out. Here's Elizabeth walking up to the guards, and the guards pointed her down the block, which would be into the teeth of a mob. Also notice what is happening in this picture. The white students are allowed to go to school on the first day, and the African American students were denied. And they were denied by the state. They were denied by the highest officer in the state, the governor. Elizabeth walked into the teeth of a mob, and in that mob were students from her school, as well as adults and members of the Little Rock community. Um, looking at these pictures, one can only imagine the language that is being used, the message that is being delivered to this 15-year-old student who simply wanted to go to school to get a better education. Now I'll show you a brief film clip. Throughout the course of one's life, there are many moments that inspire feelings of dread and anxiety, the first day of school being no exception. The stress associated with making sure all your clothes look right, all your books are in order, and preparing for the intimidating process of making friends are all major concerns on the minds of those stepping into their first days of their educational lives. Yet the butterflies one might feel in their stomach on their first day of school simply cannot compare to the terror that the Little Rock Nine must have felt on their first day at a racially segregated public school. Terror is defined as an instance of or cause of intense fear or anxiety, and to say that these integrating students felt simple anxiety would be an immense understatement. On September 4, 1957, Ernest Green, Elizabeth Eckford, Jefferson Thomas, Terrence Roberts, Carlotta Walls-Lanier, 
Minnie Jean Brown, Gloria Ray Karamark, Thelma Mothershed, and Melba Beals would make their first steps into Little Rock Central High School in Arkansas. Pictured here is Elizabeth Eckford, bravely making her way to her first classes in the desegregated public education system. Yet intense hatred and racism would confront her at every corner, leading Governor Orville Faubus to deploy the Arkansas National Guard and President Dwight Eisenhower to deploy the 101st Airborne Division to enforce the integration and escort the students to their classes. The sheer terror that Eckford and her fellow African-American students must have felt upon entering the explosive school grounds that fateful morning cannot be fathomed. Notice the large crowd of students and citizens behind Eckford, following her every step to confront her every move on the school campus. Regarding the accompanying crowd, Eckford recalled, they moved closer and closer. I tried to see a friendly face somewhere in the crowd, someone who could maybe help. Someone started yelling, lynch her, lynch her. Perhaps this could have been the student directly behind her, who appears to be intensely jeering Eckford, attempting to break down her mental and emotional walls with words of unimaginable hate, in hopes that the African-American students would simply leave their school. Observe the armed guards to the back left of Eckford and their tense and braced postures, waiting for the vocal protest to turn violent. While Eckford herself may have a calm look of indifference, inside, it can be assumed that sheer terror has taken over. Despite a federal mandate to integrate all public schools in 1954 under Brown versus Board of Education, resistance still lingered, making the tension thicker and life harder for students like Eckford. For her, this first day of school is quite a bit more intense than any first day that anyone in the present day can imagine. Fortunately for Eckford and her fellow African-American students, they would be successfully integrated and that fateful day would simply become a memory of time past. So while opportunity would liberate them from the reins of segregation, for the Little Rock Nine, the sheer terror felt on that historic morning will not be forgotten anytime soon. And it was not just the first day that the students went to school. Uh, for the entire school year, uh, these nine brave students would face that terror on a daily basis. It would be a school year like no other. Uh, effigies hung outside of the school, signs, intense, mean stares, uh, jeering, physical assaults, psychological, emotional assaults, coming to school every day with signs outside saying that they are, those students were not wanted. Eventually having a military escort from class to class, a military escort to get to class. This, these are the challenges that these students would face on a daily basis. You need to ask yourself, if we put ourselves in Elizabeth's shoes, how would you feel to be harassed every single day? To be told that you were not wanted? To be subjected to verbal, physical, psychological abuse every single day just because you wanted to get an education? What might those experiences you do to you in the short term, and what might they do to you in the long term? Think about that all the abuse that these students faced and what that may have done to them. Elizabeth Beckford, from that experience, as a 15-year-old, uh, suffered from what has been diagnosed as post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, this is a psychological condition uh, that can result in flashbacks, uh, physical manifestations, and can cause her terrific, or excuse me, terrible anxiety. Uh, it is a very serious condition, one that she has been dealing with her, her entire life due to that one year at Central High School. Ms. Eckford does not come and speak to public schools anymore. This is a terrific exception for us. Uh, she knows the reputation of the school, she knows the reputation of the student body, and she knows that this is, that Sequoia is a safe place. And so when Ms. Eckford comes out to speak with us today, we need to show her incredible respect uh, and we need to protect 
this effort as well. And I know that we are all up for doing that. So when Ms. Eckford comes out to speak with us, uh, I know that a lot of us are very grateful for all of her efforts and would like to show our appreciation to her. And a lot of us might want to show that appreciation by perhaps a standing ovation, cheering, and clapping our hands. We, we cannot do that. We cannot do that because that will trigger some of the PTSD uh, flashbacks. And that could be very, very problematic. So instead, when I bring Ms. Eckford out, uh, as a group, if we would like to show our appreciation, we certainly can give her applause, but we will do that through the use of American Sign Language. And I think a lot of your teachers have already prepped you on it. Uh, so maybe as a group, we could all practice right now. What would that look like when Ms. Eckford comes out, please? The higher your hands, the louder your applause. Okay? Uh, if you all decide to provide Ms. Eckford with a standing ovation to recognize her contributions, that would be perfectly acceptable, but please be gentle with your seat backs as they snap back as well. Uh, we do not want to cause a whole lot of a racket and commotion as she comes out. Sequoia High School, please welcome Elizabeth Eckford. recognized 
and supported by the white population. So you see, we have come a tremendous, tremendous difference, distance. In the past two years, we've had some traumatic um, um, examples of police brutality. But this has happened all along. And now we are paying attention. Um, I'm going to take questions. Um, and, but, but before that, I want to tell you why uh, we talk about Little Rock. It is it's significant in American history. Because it is a place where a conflict between state and federal government was resolved. It's important to our constitutional history. Um, the images from that time still persist in, um, at the turn of the century, the Associated Press said that that mob scene picture was one of the 50 most iconic pictures of the century. Um, so um, when I decided to go to Central High School, when I decided to to be part of, of uh, change. We never anticipated that it would be like what we experienced. Because in the 1950s, uh, I was accustomed, I, I had heard uh, racist language. Um, but I had never been in a school where uh, violence was tolerated. When I signed up to go to Central, I didn't expect to be knocked down on the stairs, kicked, scalded in the shower. All that was far. When we first, um, I'm going to pause here. So um, to set some context, the students have been prepared. The students know the history of the Little Rock Nine. They've read accounts, analyzed pictures, watched video. Uh, and discuss the impact of some of your actions. Uh, and again, we're all thrilled and honored to have you here with us today. So thank you very much, Ms. Eckford, for making the trip. Um, we have uh, a mix of student and teacher questions prepared. We've divided them into, into three different groups, pre-central, uh, at Central High School, and then post-Central High School. So we're gonna jump right in with uh, pre-Central High School. Uh, Nellie Duran would like to know, uh, what was life like growing up in segregated Little Rock? Um, I felt enveloped by my community. I lived in uh, what one would describe as a fringe neighborhood. Um, the races were not se not separated by artificial barri by artificial barriers like across the pond uh, on the other side of the railroad track in my immediate neighborhood. I lived in an old section of Little Rock where um, the houses were individually owned um, for Negroes that had never been much rental property. Um, I grew up in a very old-fashioned household where we were expected to say just yes ma'am, no sir, and not argue, never argue. But we could have discussions at the dinner table. And um, a, a person who's been important to a couple of generations in my family, a very outspoken person, was my grandfather. My father, when he would have uh, difficulty on the job, he would uh, ask somebody uh, to talk to this, discuss it with the shop steward. He didn't openly rebel. My mother had grown up in the country and had been very dependent on white goodwill. She left the country rural area in order to get a high school education past the eighth grade. So she had come to Little Rock like many people from all parts of Arkansas in order to get um, the best education a Negro could get anywhere in Arkansas. You see, Central High was built the cost of a million and a half dollars in 1927. Two years later, when they were planning to build a high school for us, Dunbar, 
the district that I had on Bobby complete school center was built for 2,100 students. Dunbar was built for 600 students. The um, school district anticipated that for vocational education, my folks would learn how to work in laundries and learn how to uh, learn domestic work. Because the only, only work available to them was unskilled labor. But um, there was a man, a Sears executive, named Julius Rosenbaum, who had built one-room schoolhouses throughout the South so that Negroes could have a school to go to. Um, in the separate but equal, so-called separate but equal uh, part of, of uh, communities, of ways of doing things. That was overlaid by support for white supremacy. So it was what we had never was going to be, never intended to be equal, even if it was new. So um, Dunbar offered, uh, in addition to the academic courses, offered uh, carpentry, bricklaying auto mechanics, and printing for the boys, and typing for the girls. This meant that even though those tradespeople um, were not welcome in the unions and were not welcome in the apprenticeship committees, that they would, could develop skills and eventually, perhaps, um, be their own, be contractors. But on the way uh, to earning money, they had to sometimes work for white contractors. So even the, if a person was a master bricklayer, he was hired as the bricklayer's helper when he worked for uh, a white contractor. So I grew up in that time. In, I grew up in a time when any neighbor any adult could correct me and my siblings. And, and my folks would learn about this behavior and we would get some correction at home. So that's a lot of pressure to behave. And in addition to that, I was a very, very shy person, not an outspoken person. Um, the person who wrote a book about me um, did a lot of research. And he talked to some of my former classmates who had taught me in elementary and junior high school. And one person said that I would raise my hand in class, but look shocked when I was called upon. Um, another question? Um, so moving to, uh, thank you for that. So moving on to Central High School, a couple of questions that are interrelated here. Uh, what made you want to go to Central High School? Uh, when you signed up to go to Central, what were your parents' reactions? And did you know any of the other nine before you went that school year? Um, I knew Minnie Jean Brown because at one, at, during one year, she was my next door neighbor. I knew um, of Ernest Green because my mother had, had lived in the household of a teacher and she knew uh, Mrs. Green who was an, uh, at, that, at that, that time an elementary teacher, no, a, a high school teacher, and she eventually became an elementary teacher. She had taught my younger siblings. Um, I didn't know um, Melba Patillo at all. I didn't know um, Gloria Ray at all, or Jefferson Thomas. I knew Terrence Roberts because I remember him from school. Uh, I, were you friends with any of these folks, or no, you just kind of no, knew? No, no, no. We were. So what well, became the Little Rock Nine, which probably is from a newspaper headline, uh, we were individuals who had signed up to go to Central. Why, and, did, why did you go? Why, why did you decide to go? And what were your parents' reactions? Uh, my grandfather had always told me, Liz, bad. 
when you go to college, so and so. He uh, so I had grown up even knowing that my parents could not afford to send me to college because both my mother and my father worked two jobs in order to pay the mortgage, the condo, and support six children. Um, I knew they couldn't afford to send me to college. Um, but I grew up expecting to go to college. So uh, I wanted to go to Central to be as well prepared as possible. And I was hoping to get several scholarships or, so, to finance my education. Moving to that first day, that day that you walked alone and that iconic picture of the century that you were referring to earlier, um, the rest of the Little Rock Nine had met up earlier at the, uh, little, at the NAACP leader Daisy Bates' house. You were not a part of that group. Um, I was wondering if you could speak to why that happened and mm -hmm. then... Um, our, our, we didn't have a phone in our household. Um, my parents' priorities were different. Because um, the phone was an extra, probably unnecessary expense until after my, my uh, experience with the mob. Um, we had got, only got a television because we begged to go to other kids' houses to watch TV. And my mother was an overly protective person. Secretly, I called her the Queen of No. Um, when the we Queen were of No? Yes. And that's because every time you asked a question, the answer was? Uh, no. And um, one of the things that we were told by the superintendent was that he would make the final choice. Uh, and that those chosen ones had to meet two criteria. They had to be good students, and they couldn't be troublemakers. What was a troublemaker in the 1950s? Chewing gum in class? Talking off, off the subject? Or having a schoolyard fist fight? Well, not only was I shy and submissive, I didn't know how to fight. It was something that we were not allowed to do. The only, only person I fought was my older sister um, and the boy next door. Um, because both of, the, both of them ch chased me around when we had a conflict. Um, but I, I, violence was not part of what one would expect in going to school. The tolerance of violence was not something that one would expect. Um, the superintendent also told us that we could not talk back regardless of what was said to us, and we could not strike back. Um, I understood that we were pioneers, but we were not, we didn't start out as an organized group. 85 students in junior high and high school signed up to go to Central the following fall. Um, the, the superintendent was very careful to, to uh, eliminate those students who were part of an NAACP suit against the school board. Um, when he talked to me and my parents, it was, his conversation was a patronizing and slightly intimidating, which is the way white people were used to controlling us back then. Um, so um, he set the ground rules, but they were not foreign to me. I, I understood 